Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is David Beck. And David is a fee-only certified financial planner. His practice is called Bay Area Planners, and it focuses on helping families plan for finance and college education. David came to the United States from England in 1982. He worked in product management for electronic component manufacturers, including Tyco, before starting a second career in financial planning. David graduated in 2006 from the financial planning program at the University of California at Santa Cruz Extension. He chose the college planning specialty after helping his niece with financing issues for her college education and it's developed into his full-time business. He says that he's found helping people in this area to be very rewarding. So today, David and I are going to be talking about how tax savings can help a family pay for a college education. David, thank you for coming and being my guest today. Pleasure to be here. Okay. So as we get started, I just want to caution our viewers that this is just an introduction to this area and uh, you can get help from uh, other professionals uh, for further guidance. Uh, I'm a tax uh, advisor, CPA, and David is a financial planner, uh, again, who specializes in this area. So you can get additional guidance there. There's also some IRS publications on this uh, that are pretty good. So Publication 970. Okay, so Publication 970. Uh, look it up at the web, www.irs.gov. It's free, and you can uh, uh, print it out and uh, get some good information there about uh, what are some of the uh, tax benefits that are available for education. It's one of the cheapest sleep aids that I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, good bedtime reading. Mm. Okay. Well, Dave, let's get started with a few of the questions here. So what is the principal federal tax credit that helps in paying education costs? It's called the American Opportunity Credit. Uh, it's new. It came in with President Obama. It replaced something called the HOPE credit. It was due f for two years and then it got extended um, in, so it, it now will go through 2012. Mm -hmm. um, it's, very, it's a very useful credit. Um, previously, the, the, the main credit, the HOPE credit, uh, began to phase out for families uh, at about 100 to $120,000. Mm -hmm. uh, that made it less useful for a lot of families. Right. This one is is good up to 160, and then begins to phase out, and is phased out by 180 thousand dollars of of adjusted gross income. Mm -hmm. So it um, it benefits a lot more families than the the Hope Credit. Also, it's for more money. The Hope Credit was 1,800 dollars. This is 2,500 dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so all told, yeah, it's a great credit. Good. Okay. We have to wait and see what happens in 2012. Right. So, as unfortunately happens with so many things, we're, many of us are in the edge of our seat. Um, basically, uh, the Bush uh, tax benefits were extended. Uh, they were supposed to expire after 2010. They were extended through 2012. And so now we're waiting to see what happens with tax mm. rates <laughs> and, and with these tax credits. All right, so what are some other tax benefits that are offered for higher education? Um, well, just before we leave the American Opportunity okay. Credit so that okay. people can right. fully understand it, one of the great things about it is that part of it is refundable, a refundable oh. credit, Yes, uh, $1,000. So although the maximum amount is $2,500, even a family that pays no tax can get 1000 of that. So you can actually get some money in your pocket, mm -hmm. uh, even though swiftly to go out to pay for that <laughs> college education cost. <laughs> so, so um, uh, one thing we don't really know is is how many people would benefit from the American Opportunity Credit that haven't taken it, that uh, didn't know it was there, didn't understand it, or their tax preparer didn't understand it. Um, so I've heard numbers like such as twenty percent of families that could be benefiting from it aren't. Hmm. Um, because when we look at, you know, you were, you were asking about what are the other educational tax benefits. Um, the others are basically the lifetime learning credit mm -hmm. and the tuition and fees deduction. And 
and you know those are, are much less beneficial for families. Right. Lifetime learning credit, um, so it's really eclipsed by the by the American Opportunity Credit. However, it may come back depending on what happens with the um, in, after 2012. The yeah. benefits of the lifetime learning credit are that it's the only credit that will apply for a fifth year, uh, and only and the only credit that will apply to um, um, postgraduate work. Yes, uh, it's worth less. It's it's 20 percent of 20 percent of your tuition and fees up to um, two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So if your tuition and fees were less than ten thousand, you wouldn't get the full two thousand. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, uh, what else? Uh, the tuition and fees deduction is a separate item. Right, so, so we have actually an above the line deduction, if you will. Instead of an itemized deduction, you can get a, a deduction. So, so in other words, people can get it even if they're claiming the standard deduction on their income tax return, which is a, a those are, those are always more valuable deductions when they're what we call above the line. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> yeah. So instead of a, a credit, which is a dollar for dollar reduction in tax, a deduction you know reduces the amount of money that is taxed. But for some families, that can work out to be more. Mm -hmm. It really requires the tax preparer. You know, hopefully using professional software to uh, to understand which of those deductions works out the best. Right, and a lot of them, the software has some things that are built in to try to help you to get to the right results. Mm -hmm. The tuition and fees deduction, though, it has to be renewed every year. So, so if we think the, you know, the chances of the the American Opportunity Credit being renewed in 2012 may be low, the tuition and fees may also be very low. So. Are we still waiting for that one to be renewed for 2012? Yeah. yeah okay, so, so we don't know if we're going to even get that deduction for 2012. Right. Yeah. How about student loan interest? Student loan interest um, you know, can get you a deduction up to $2,500 on money for a student loan uh, or a loan for higher education. The difficulty with the student loan as opposed to the parent loan is that this, this interest deduction is for the holder of the loan. Um, and if that's the student... You mean the person who owes the money. Yes, the person <laughs> who owes the money. And if that's the student, um, you know, maybe the student can't take advantage of that. They may not have very much income right now. Not very much income, not, very, not owe too much, uh, or more importantly, not be taking their own personal exemption. Yeah. Uh, if they're not taking their own personal exemption, they're not going to get that deduction. Okay. Or, or and the parent okay. who, who is taking their deduction, their exemption, uh, it's the loan's not in the parent's name. Mm -hmm. The parent can take the deduction for their own loans, mm -hmm. uh, but the student loan interest deduction might have to wait. Okay. What if you need to take some money from an IRA account? You can take money from an IRA account. And the, the, um, the higher education benefit is that you won't get the penalty, the 10% penalty for taking it out of the IRA. Uh, but as a financial planner, I have to counsel against people using the IRA uh, to pay for college. Um, that is the parent's IRA. Yes. An exception to that would be the student who has sufficient earnings to be able to put money into an IRA, mm -hmm. to be able to afford to put money into an IRA and then take it back out for college. Uh -huh. that, so you're using there the IRA as a, as a kind of temporary holding account um, uh, to keep that money. Yeah. So the issue there though uh, for the parents partly is that even though they may have all these college expenses, they also might have quite a bit of other income and they may end up paying tax at a pretty high rate on the money that they take out of their IRA. Well, uh, that and the fact that, you know, as, as they say, you can borrow for college, you can't borrow for retirement. So mm -hmm. at some point they do have to retire and, you know, hopefully that's when they would be used in their IRA. Mm -hmm. If they're tapping the IRA to pay for college, then I have to ask what kind of, you know, retirement they're going to have mm -hmm. uh, later on. Yes, okay. Now you said that higher income families should look for tax savings. What do you mean by that? Um, well, you can start off with the same tax credit we just talked of, but when, I'm, when we're really thinking higher income, 
mm -hmm. uh, maybe even above the $180,000 cutoff on the tax credit, uh, then we're looking at tax savings when we're looking at the overall family situation. So you have the, the parents filing a tax return, obviously, um, but do you also have a student filing the tax return? Uh, in many families, they include any income uh, from the student on their own tax return. Uh, they're able to do that. Um, but at some point, the student earns enough uh, to be able to file their own tax return. So if you have basically uh, investment income like dividends and interest, uh, then you can elect to, uh, and if the child is subject to the kiddie tax, which most of them are, uh, then you're going to have, you can elect to have it reported on the parent's income tax return. Right. And sometimes it just, it's sort of a convenience uh, to yeah, do it. Yeah, it's a convenience. You're, you're only filing one tax return. Um, yeah. uh, you've always been used to the, having the child on your tax return as, as the child's been gaining age. Uh, but at some point, you know, does it make more sense for the student to be filing their own tax return? Um, so what we have then is two tax returns, the parents and the student. And yeah. what the idea is that to uh, shift money from the parents' tax return, where it's probably being taxed at 25, 28, or even higher percentage rate, to the student, where it might only be at 10 or 15 percent. Yeah. Well, well, we'll get into kitty tax in a moment, but anyway. <laughs> but, uh, so what are some ways that you can shift income to a student? Um, uh, the best income to shift is that which will be actually counted at the income tax rate of the parents. Uh, so for example, interest income. Interest income you know, goes on the front page of your tax return uh, and if it stays there, it will be taxed at the parents' tax rate. Uh, rents. Rents are a great one, in my opinion. Uh, rents also are taxed at the income tax rate of the parent. Non-qualified dividends, also income tax. So we have the money that is being taxed at, like I say, 25, 28, or even higher percentage rate. If that is shifted to the student in some way, um, then with the standard deduction and maybe even the exemption, uh, the student will end up paying no tax. Okay. And if the student does owe tax, maybe the student will be the one taking the American Opportunity Credit. So it's possible to earn, to, to have a student with a, an adjusted gross income of about $29,000 and not pay a penny in tax by taking all of the standard deduction, the personal exemption, and the American Opportunity Credit. Okay. It's not easy to have your student have an income of $29,000, but it can be done. Yeah. Well, again, if they're working, that, that's a big thing because that qualifies for more of the standard deduction uh, when the, for the W-2 income of the child. The other thing is, is when we say shift income, it's not a matter of, oh, I've got this interest here. <laughs> I think I'll just put it on my child's tax return. Mm -hmm. In order to shift that income, you have to actually shift the assets that it relates to. So That's right. that means